Hi, welcome everybody. We are doing our live Q&A. Hopefully now you've been able to join in. We had a small technical glitch, um, but we're hopefully getting on and double checking our technology right now. Uh, in the meantime, my name is Nikki Witkowski. I'm with the Purdue Extension Office in Porter County. Uh, real quick, I'll tell you a little bit about Purdue Extension is that we are here in the county in order to answer questions for people. So I am here to answer questions live about plants and insects and diseases that you may be experiencing in your gardens. So while we're waiting for any live comments to come in, a couple quick comments that I will make right now. Um, and yes, we are out in nature. You might have just see a lovely little bee just fly through our screen. Um, but the biggest thing I want to point out right now is the fact that, yes, it is getting into fall timing, but obviously right now we're in a huge drought. So please do make sure that if you have any sensitive plants, they really do need some extra water right now. We're seeing fall colors come on extremely early this year because plants are getting so dry. So do be aware of that. Do be watching out for that, especially if you've planted any new plants this year. You may have to give them some extra water right now. Even if you plant them in the last year or two, still probably wouldn't hurt to make sure they're getting water. I will note that a difference is like, for example, your lawn and an established plants, those can usually go one to two weeks without water. They may go into a dormant phase where your lawns, yes, they may turn brown. But seeing how we have some lower temperatures coming, that will actually help them to survive this drought period better. If we probably go two or more weeks without at least a half an inch of rain, you could see some death in your turf due to the drought. But again, just kind of watch and see what happens. Um, Hurricane Laura that I know right now is saying is only supposed to come up to southern Indiana. But if it comes a little higher or they keep forecasting, we may have some showers and thunderstorms in the next couple days. Obviously that will help as well as as soon as we get out of these higher humidities and heats in the next couple days, that will also help to basically prevent um, some death from plants or death in uh, lawn plants as well. So keep that in mind because we usually tell you to water into the fall, but this time of year right now that we're in, you especially need to be aware of water into the fall. One of the things you may see because of that effect, and I actually have lost one of my leaves already, um, you may see how we have some leaves that are starting to yellow out uh, comparatively to our green leaves. This is a survival mechanism of certain plants. So this is an eastern cottonwood, and it is a survival mechanism of the plant to basically drop some of these lower leaves. Um, there are maybe even more yellow ones. Tulip trees do that as well. Again, like I said, that's a survival mechanism. Don't necessarily be worried yet about them because the less leaf matter it has on the tree, the less water it needs. So that's why they will do things like that of dropping some of the lower leaves or some of the more inner leaves of the plant because when you look at it, uh, this side of it is basically the inside of the plant. So it's basically saying, I'm gonna lose some of these leaves but keep my best ones going so that that way I can put my water that I can get to good use. So again, don't be too worried that you're seeing like sporadic yellow leaves because it may not be a huge problem yet, but just watch how far it goes. If you're getting the red in color, you again, you could try some watering on it to see if you can help it a little bit. It might be a little late, um, but I would not be concerned unless your whole tree starts turning that way. Spot leaves and things like that aren't as big of a problem. The other thing you're going to start seeing coming up is going to be obviously disease leaves. So I have um, an example. This is actually a type of a dogwood. Um, you can obviously see here that you do have some spots and verging on a lot of spots. You're going to see more spots coming up on plants like this because of the stress. So it may have had some concerns all along, but because of the stress, you can see we're about ready to lose this leaf because it is highly yellow and the spots are going to get worse. Just like us, plants have an ability to try to thwart most problems as long as it can. But now that they're not getting a lot of water, those problems are just getting worsened. And so that's why you're going to see more spots like this. I know the next thing that people are going to start wondering then is, gee, I see spots. Should I treat? Well, 
the answer may not be yes, because what you have to keep in mind is that if this came on late season, and if it came on because of the drought, your plant may actually be pretty healthy and it just finally kind of succumbed to some of this. So what I would be recommending is that if this were your plant next year, watch it. See what happens. If it starts getting kind of spotty and looking a little bit bad early next year, like in April and May or something like that, then go ahead and let's figure out, first off, what is wrong with it. We do have certain plants like cherries, a cherry plant or a cherry tree specifically, and it can be ornamental cherries as well. But cherries especially like to have stress spots. So they'll have spots just like this where there's small little dots, and it can also be termed for them to be shotgunny. So they'll get a small spot, and then the center will fall out and flick out, just like if you shot a shotgun at it. So again though, I said it was a stress factor. So it wasn't a disease at all. It wasn't anything wrong with it. It just had stress that called it to be shotgunning. Think of that like in us. Sometimes when we get stressed, some people may get itchy, some people get anxiety. There are other outward signs that's not an actual illness that needs to be treated, but there are other outward signs that we can show to show stress without being a disease that needs treated. So watch out at this time of the year for different signs and symptoms. The other thing that you can do is, for example, you can get spotty things on some of your perennials. Watch your perennials and see, okay, if they're spotty now, like your peonies, peonies can get really spotty. If they get really spotty, then one thing that you can do is say, okay, it's probably leaf blotch. If they're getting a really bad infestation of leaf blotch, then if it's been six to eight weeks since they flowered, maybe it's time to just cut down the entire peony because you've hopefully cut off the flower heads already. But maybe we cut down the entire peony plant now because at the six to eight week mark, what you have to realize is that it's put enough resources into the ground so that that way you can actually survive the next year. It isn't going to grow by gangbusters and it's not necessarily going to more profusely flower than what it did by cutting it down quicker than what it would have died down. But what you are trying to do is trying to stop that foliage that looks spotty and sick. You're trying to stop the spotty sick foliage from falling to the ground that can then by rain and other means go back up into the plant the following year. So you cut the foliage down you cannot compost it on site unless you guarantee that you get high enough temperatures overnight that you won't have a problem. But you can compost it so that, or I'm sorry, you can throw it away so that that way you know you won't get infection next year. But again, by cutting it down early, we're removing the infectious part of it so that hopefully we're lessening what can reinfect it in years to come. So again, wait six to eight weeks after flower. If you've got spotty leaves, cut the stems off, throw them out. And then if you do that enough successive years, you should hopefully either get the disease down to a manageable level on like your peonies, or you might even fully eradicate it. This can work on certain other diseases as well. So I mentioned the peony blotch. This could work as well if you have powdery mildew issues. So powdery mildew can develop on your peonies or the other thing that powdery mildew typically develops would be on like your Monarda or bee balm. That's another great example of, again, if we're able to trim off that foliage at a certain time of the year, we may be able to remove those plants and be able to actually, again, lessen the amount of inoculum for the coming years. Now I also want to point out, because obviously I didn't say anything, but you do get sometimes holes in your leaves. So some of these holes, yeah, we might have had an insect that, you know, caused a problem and they had some chewing injury on it earlier in the year. But keep in mind, holes or marrings on the leaves can be from different things. So for example, yes, this could have been, because it's a dogwood plant, we could have had a little bit of a dogwood sawfly injury 
especially since this tip is left here and you may not, I acknowledge see it well and I just broke it off, but we may have had a dog with sawfly larvae that started at the tip, kind of made it shadowy and deadish tissue here that was then later, later able to eat through the whole leaf. So watch for that kind of stuff. But even this damage here, it's very minor. It's like having like four or five spots on my hand. And that's not bad when you consider the whole leaf surface. So keep that in mind. Versus here's another plant you could look at. And this is actually an elm tree. So when we look at this elm leaf, we do see that some of these leaves are damaged to a higher degree. Now what's interesting is you can tell sometimes on which side of the leaf they're chewing on because, and this is not going to show well unless in person or under a microscope the best, but if you look at the leaf, it's a lot cleaner edges on the front, whereas if I turn it over on the back, you see a lot more either edges where that are brown, or you see also some of it how it looks like, especially in a brown area here, we can also almost see what we call window painting, where basically the insect probably ate from the underside of the leaf, so if it was normally flat like this on the tree, it ate from this side and just took off layers and then once it takes off part of that layer it might fall out just like that shotgunning we talked about earlier so this was probably something like a elm flea weevil or beetle that did a little bit of this damage but even at this stage this is not a lot we'd had three good leaves at the top we had an infection point here in the middle the lower leaves were fine as well so we really don't need to so worry about this because overall on this tree, this was minor of the damage. So don't really worry. We have a lot of good green foliage otherwise out. And even when I compare this to, again, that eastern cottonwood that has the yellow leaves, we can tolerate this because our leaves are still healthy and growing. Now the other thing I can show as a contrast, and this one's going to be the harder one to see, is that this leaf here, if you kind of get a good look at it, you can see kind of a trail that starts on this side and kind of goes around and ends in a spot in the middle. So when you see that, what you're actually seeing is another type of an insect. So this insect is called a leaf miner. So what actually happened is the fact that the baby leaf miner started kind of maybe in the middle of this leaf, because I can see a very minor pattern on the back of it that way. It started here and started chewing and what you may or may not have noticed is the fact that the trail widened as it came up and around it got really big and then it kind of stopped so I'm going to put it back up and you can kind of again try to take another look at that and see and then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to flip it over because when I flip it over what you also may see is that in the middle of that leaf there's actually a big round circle well guess what that leaf miner insect probably became an adult and came out of the leaf. Now, I love leaf miners because they're one of the more interesting insects in my mind. They are interesting because most insects are on the outside and we chew them and we see them. And we either realize they eat on the top of the leaf like our Japanese beetles and that we spray the top of the leaf and we can take care of them. Some of them, like the flea weevil that I mentioned on here, or my other great example of a bottom, I'll say, feeder of the leaf is a uh, rose slug sawfly. So yes, I said slug, like slugs, but it's not a slug. It's more like a caterpillar because it's in the sawfly family. If you've ever looked at your roses in about April and started seeing that they are holy and starting to get holes in them chewed, I guarantee you are suffering actually from a rose slug sawfly. And what they do is they actually chew on the undersides. They are a very, very light green insect that blend in very well with the leaf surface. And like I said, they're on the underside because then they avoid the birds. So there's not many predators that are always looking on the underside of the leaf. What typically then them might happen, unfortunately, is people are going to actually say, oh no, the Japanese beetles are out early. So I need to spray my roses on the top to take care of the insect problem. And they use a contact type of an insecticide more. Well, that's a good thought. But the problem is, where did I say the pest was? It's not on the top. It's on the bottom. 
So if you're using a contact insecticide, it has to contact the insect. But again, I said the rose slug sawfly contact is on the base or on the bottom of the leaf. So unless we're spraying up, which any of you think about that, you could be spraying up into your face, but unless we're spraying up from the bottom, we could have a hard time actually hitting those insects. Now, I talk about the rose slug sawfly, but I will also point out, usually you don't have too disastrous of damage. And because you have to spray the bottom of the leaf, I would say you, you have probably two recommendations of what you could do. Yes, we could try to spray it with something so that that way when we spray it, we might use something that's actually called a systemic insecticide. So something that we might spray on it that would then be absorbed by the leaf surface and then it would go down and kill the insect. You can also sometimes get products you pour around the base and that's systemic because then the roots will actually uptake the nutrient or uptake the insecticide and spread it throughout and that will hit it. Now, I said you could spray, but at the same token, there's a lot of problems with insects and stuff like that that, like I mentioned, aren't really going to cause a huge problem. And if they're not causing a huge problem, it calls them a question, do we need to treat? Now, if they are a problem, you could go there and manually smash them. Or the other option you actually could do is water them. You could actually take a hose with a forceful spray of water aimed upwards, so like get something like with an end, and basically give your rose a bath on the underside. So spray it up into the plant to try to wash it off the leaves. And you could try doing that once or twice because you might need to water it too. It's not going to hurt to water it. And during that process, you may wash off the insect. And then you just controlled it without having to use anything to control it. So there are a lot of options out there on insect control without necessarily always going for a bottle. And because, like I said, yeah, they're, they're not a major pest. And even if it did defoliate a part of your rose, uh, Plants that are established are pretty hardy. It could probably still come back from one, one round of being defoliated in a year and still survive well. You may not have the best flowers that year, but it will still look good and be able to produce for you and at least continue on in life. Now, I guess I never fully answered. So why I know if you have holes in April is because again, the sawfly comes out in March to April. I'd love to ask a question and get a response, but for time's sake and because I, I don't know how quickly some of you are going to be at the uh, keyboards, the thing I'll throw out there is, do you realize when Japanese beetles are actually supposed to emerge from the soil? Now, the fact that they emerge from the soil might be a new concept for some of you, but when you actually pay attention to when they're supposed to emerge from the soil, it's in May. It's the startings of May. So that's why, again, we need to know our insects a little bit and know our problem so that that way we know, okay, so the Japanese beetle is not supposed to emerge till May, but if I start getting holy plants in either March or April, there's something else up. And that's a good reason why to start paying attention to our plants and start looking at them and saying, what's going wrong? What you know do we need to look at? And I will also put in a plug again, because like I said, I work for Purdue Extension, and I'll put in that there is an extension office in every county in Indiana. So whether you're watching this from Porter County, Lake County, Laporte, or any other county in Indiana, and there are extension offices in other states as well, you can contact your local extension office, or you can contact a surrounding one as well, and ask these questions and say, hey, I have this problem. And there's almost always an extension educator either in that office or another office that's able to assist you or there are master gardeners that are usually there able to answer these questions and ask uh, maybe more questions to clarify, you know, well, what are you seeing? Where are you seeing? What plant? And usually, especially because we figure you're calling about an immediate problem like our leaf miner now or if it's in April, a rose, we can usually figure out pretty quickly you know, what may be going on. We do have the occasional surprise insect that I will denote, for example, that people have been very worried about murder hornets. And I've had a rash of calls about those lately, about, oh no, 
I think I have a murder hornet. Well, but keep in mind, we kind of have feet on the ground a little bit and have resources and know that when you do the research, murder hornets started in Washington. Not to say they can't travel, because they can travel, but a murder hornet is a species of wasp that is a rather large wasp. We already have species here like that. And the number one that is easily right now confused with murder hornets are your cicada killers. Guess what? Those are emerging now because cicadas are emerging now. So we do have our cicada killer wasps that are coming out, chasing down the cicadas. And they're called cicada killers for a reason because they wind up paralyzing the cicada when they catch it and then shoving it in the burrows they dig in our dirt to feed their young. So that's why they're called cicada killers, is because their main goal is to grab a cicada to feed their young. So these are the ones that will burrow and make, you know, a hole somewhere between the sides of, I'll say, a nickel to a quarter. So if you see holes in your ground, single holes about the size of a nickel to a quarter, you may have a cicada killer wasp. Again, they can be anywhere from one to two inches big. The good thing is, is when you hear the horror stories of, I drove my mower over a hornet's nest and it was horrible. We have hornets and bees that like to live in communities. And we have some that are called solitary. The cicada killer falls under the solitary stance. They don't group together. They live separately in their own homes and do not congregate. So if you were to run over one of their holes, the likelihood is you may be dealing with one maybe two adults, that's it. The other good thing is, is the fact that they're solitary and if they're just digging a hole, the females aren't going to be really worried about you unless they've laid eggs and are feeding young. So if they're laying eggs and feeding young, they would have a tendency to possibly chase you. Otherwise, for the most part, they're going to ignore you. One easy way to know, do you have a murder hornet versus cicada killer, is if you look at their abdomen, which their abdomen is basically their back half, if you see white there, that's not a murder hornet. Those usually are straight black and yellow. So if you see white, it's possibly a cicada killer instead. A murder hornet also usually has a bright yellow head. Our cicada killers don't. They usually have more of a black head. But I will say in any case, if you think that you are wondering what you do have, because we do have to keep our eyes out for invasive insects as well as plants and diseases, if you think you have one, feel free to contact your local extension office. Uh, it's pretty easy to find most extension offices. You can either Google Purdue Extension and get a hold of kind of a main page to be transferred, or just Google or use your Firefox or Chrome browser and just type in Purdue Extension and then the county you live in and that should actually bring up pretty close to the very first items being a link for your extension office in your home county and like I said from there then you can either call them many extension offices even with this COVID are back in their office or at least there are some staff back in their office so that that way you can call and talk to someone and then you may be able to either bring in a sample or email in a sample, uh, or again, uh, we may be able to give you a call back and talk to it. Some offices are able to even do uh, very abbreviated visits where I know I personally, I had somebody leave a sample like at their mailbox. I grabbed the sample and was able to call them right back within a very short period of time to say what was going on and help that client that way. So we do have ways to work even during these times where we can try to be safe even in your presence of either social distancing or again leaving a sample in a certain spot so that we can come pick it up or maybe flagging a tree if you need a tree check we might be able to have you flag a tree and check it that way now I've talked about a lot of you know kind of nasty stuff so far but do keep in mind that you know the weather is starting to change a little bit and it is getting late in the season and we always think about spring being the time of beauty well, I'm sure many of you can see this lovely huge U behind me here. And we don't always think about some of the beauty that can be brought in with a U. Uh, as I was sitting here earlier as we were preparing for today to come live, I all of a sudden looked down and I will show you what I found. 
it's a lovely red berry. So you can even find beauty this time of the year where you can kind of see into the berry there. But you can even find beauty at this time of the year. And what I also love that I will pluck off to make it a little bit more, or pluck around to make it a little bit more apparent, is I love this little green one right here that I'm putting my finger in front of to help uh, stand it out better. Um, but this little green one here, to me it looks just like a little mini acorn. So you can see here, we have one, and there's actually a second one here on the back side that's working on coming on red. So there are different trees that are coming into fruit this time of the year. We wouldn't normally consider this a fruit, but it is. We have different trees that are coming to their fruiting phase during this time of the year. Now that also means don't say, oh no, what is this gall or insect on my tree? Know that this is a fruit. Now, again, this is a U and this is a red fruit on the U. I have a flowering dogwood at home and they make these little balls on them that are green, but I even noticed mine is starting to turn red right now. So there are other plants that you may start seeing that the fruit of their plant is actually starting to color right now. So I challenge you to get out in the next few weeks, especially because uh, today's hopefully one of the last hot days or tomorrow, and then it's gonna start cooling off. I challenge you to go out into your landscape and see what fruits are starting to get ready to grow and color at this time of the year. You're gonna find different acorns and nuts that are making their final, you know, pushes to the end. Like I mentioned, you may find some dogwoods. If you had any magnolias, they actually have a really bizarre <coughs> shape of a fruit as well that you may be interested in seeing as well. Um, it's funny that if you actually were to look up a magnolia fruit, uh, I, I love it that during one of my training once with all of us extension educators, they actually put a sample out and they said basically what's wrong with this just like a you know one of you might bring to us they said what's wrong with this plant and that was just the question posed and it was very humorous that granted the whole discussion was all about plant diseases and galls and insects and things like that so our mindset was in a certain mindset to look for galls and things like that and the leaves were also black in a little bit, so it kind of tipped off that there was something wrong that probably had some sooty mold, which I'll discuss in a minute. But the funny thing was is that so the majority of us got it wrong because we thought that the fruiting structure was just a gall. We didn't realize it was a fruiting structure because of how it looks. It looks so different that we didn't realize it at all. So I challenge you to kind of watch for those kinds of things in the landscape right now. Now, I will denote that last year was a bad year for magnolia scale since I started talking about the magnolias. Last year was a bad year for magnolia scale, and this year wasn't a lot better. If you notice your leaves on your magnolia or your stems turning a black color, you really need to get out there and check it, or if it starts getting sticky, or if you start noticing ants at the base, or if you have something like a plant under it, that turning black and sticky. What can happen is a scale is a little itty bitty insect that can also be what they call armored or soft scale but they basically will climb onto the plant find a spot and settle down and stay think of like a turtle except turtles move once the scale settles it usually doesn't move and once it sits there it basically kind of sticks its mouth part which is a piercing sucking mouth part into the stem so that that way it can basically slowly drink from your plant now, when we think about plant sap, we obviously, you know, should remember that plants make sugars. Well, so what the scale does is it sits there and drinks the plant sap, which obviously is taking nutrition from your plant, which is why we need to be concerned is that it's taking nutrition away from the plant. But while it's sucking in those juices, the problem is sometimes it might be a slow trickle coming into the insect, but the plant's actually growing well. It may be more like a gusher coming out, and this is true with aphids too, that it may come out so fast that it goes in one end and straight out the other. And that's why your plant gets sticky is because of that sap that's coming out of the insect. Well, and think about it too. The insect eats purely sweets, so it's going to be sticky what comes out its back end. So 
that's what makes your plant sticky or if you notice something being shiny that's another problem so the scale that's why I said maybe under it um, it can make things sticky under it a great example of that can also be tulip trees on a tulip tree they can get a tulip tree scale and then you don't think about it and you're gonna park under that tulip tree and then you get out and you're like oh why is my car sticky well because you sat under a tulip tree and the stickiness of those scales basically got all over your so that's how that works now notice we also said black well if we had sticky and sweet and moisture involved in something obviously we can think about other things coming in of molds and rocks so basically that's what's happening is the fact that if you have the lovely scales creating the sticky sweet substance you get a sooty mold that grows on sticky sweet so that's why it turns black it's a sooty mold appropriately named because it looks like soot it's black so it could feel a little bit grainy or it might feel sticky depending on how bad the infestation is but that's why, again, the point is to watch out for it and see what's happening and kind of go from there. If you find you have that, to fix the black sticky, soap and water should take care of most of it. But obviously that's not solving the problem. It's going to keep happening until we solve the insect. You can do treatments. And remember, like I said, that insect is settled down and it's armored or it has a covering on it like a turtle does. So just spraying something on the surface isn't necessarily good enough. You may have to actually pour something around the plant that the plant would then uptake. All right, I'm going back to the very first part of our broadcast and pointing out we're in a drought. So if we're in a drought, is the plant uptaking much water? Well, no. The plant is not going to uptake a lot of water. And so if you put the product in the ground to help kill the scale, it's not going anywhere because the plant can't uptake it because there's not enough water. So if you're going to do a treatment for the scale, the treatment is only going to work as long as the plant is being watered. So if we don't get any natural rain, that means if you want the scale treatment to work, you're going to have to water as a trade-off. So keep that in mind that you may say, well, I tried to treat it and it didn't work. Well, just treat it when it was dry treat it you know near rain or not so make sure you're timing it now yeah if we get the scale under control then we can clean up the sooty mold because just by getting the scale under control the sooty mold won't go away like on your surfaces yeah you're gonna have to maybe use a little soapy water and that will help to take care of that but then you'll be rid of that problem hopefully but always if you had something like a scale infestation check it in future years some scales will be there one year and gone the next. Next, This magnolia scale has been here for two years now. It's not gone. If it gets infested, we are seeing problems that you know could result in at least either twig death, uh, maybe going further than that, but so far we haven't seen that for sure. But other scales can be having a different reaction. So I mentioned tulips tree scale. Or there's one called a cottony magnolia, or I'm sorry, cottony maple scale that I've seen. And they use like these little cottony balls on the tree up on the stems. For those two scales, so cottony maple scale isn't an every year problem usually. It's usually like an every two or three year problem. And it happens whenever a natural balance of insects gets a little bit out of whack. When it's out of whack, they go nuts. And then because they go nuts and the natural enemy population will pop up, take care of it, and it's done. So that, you know, tells you there are some scales that aren't a problem because we have natural things that will take care of them. The tulip tree scale, that one just seems to go on year after year without really harming a tree. So we really don't have to treat it because it really never seems to cause that much damage on the tree. And it's just an annoyance if you park your car under it. So uh, I've had family members talk to me about this, and I'm like, stop parking your car under the tree, and you'll be fine. And discussion over. There can be, though, other scales, like euonymus. If you have some of those creeping euonymuses that, you know, you put in a landscape down low, 
you do have to watch those because they can get a euonymus scale that just looks like white little flecks on the leaves and the stems. Well, it seems to always start in the base and then it works down the stem and on the backs of the leaves and then it comes over to the top of the leaves and it can encompass the plant actually rather quickly. That one can be a very dangerous scale because it actually can get into very high populations in a very rapid time and it can actually cause more damage and because the problem is, is like I said, it kind of gets down under it where you don't see it on the surface. So unless you're like pulling apart your plant and looking down to see if you see that scale, you may not see the initial phases of it. You may not see it till you're getting death of certain branches that are coming out or maybe even the whole plant at once. And because the scales stay on the leaf, the armor scale, when the scale dies at the end of the year, it may not fall off. So sometimes it can be hard to tell what's an old scale versus a new scale, but it also makes it hard when you're trying to treat it to gain the actual control 